everyone. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday, as well as upload the video version onto YouTube every Wednesday as well. And you are not going to want to miss it. Now, you guys, before we get started into today's wild case, and when I say wild, I mean wild, I wanted to make a quick little announcement and let you know if you have not noticed it already, but Killer Instinct officially has brand new cover art. This is something that's been in the works for quite some time now. It is something I am so excited about, and I hope you guys love it as much as I do. I can't wait to hear your comments on it, and it is the beginning of a new era for Killer Instinct, so it is very, very exciting. But with that being said, the case that we have here today is is one that I could not even believe as I was doing my research on it. It was one that left me speechless at times, confused at times, and I am so interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case. Even though we are one day past Halloween, I do feel like this case falls into the realm of spooky season and Halloween, and so that is why I wanted to bring it to you today. So as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about Tracy Wigginton, otherwise known as the lesbian vampire killer. Tracy Wigginton was born on August 4th, 1965 in Rockhampton, which is located in Queensland, Australia. She was born to her mom, Rhonda, and when Tracy was three years old, Rhonda and Tracy's dad ended up getting a divorce. After the divorce, Rhonda's mental health was declining, and so she decided it would be best if Tracy was raised by Rhonda's parents named Avril and George. Avril and George agreed to this, and not only that, they went ahead and legally adopted Tracy. Avril and George already had one foster daughter named Miriam, and so because of that, everyone thought that this was going to be the best thing for Tracy. It was going to be a smooth transition. These were her grandparents. She was going to be able to grow up with another girl living in the house. However, shortly after moving in with Avril and George, Tracy realized that this best decision was actually a nightmare. Now, for starters, George and Avril's marriage was definitely a tumultuous one. George was having multiple affairs during his marriage and even went to the extent of purchasing another home to take the women that he was having these affairs with to. Now, Avril was aware of these affairs. However, she didn't really do anything about it. George was a successful businessman. He was savvy and he was able to financially provide for his family. However, everything else fell lackluster to say the least. Now, not only was George having these affairs with multiple women outside of his marriage, he was also sexually abusing both Tracy and Miriam. Now, again, like I said, Avril knew about these affairs, and it was said that she also was aware of the abuse between George and the girls. However, she didn't do anything about it. When it came to Avril's past, she also grew up in a tumultuous household, an abusive household, and sadly, that pattern of behavior continued when it came to raising Tracy and Miriam. Now, it was said that out of the two girls, Miriam definitely experienced the worst of the abuse. It was said that she was beat up to four times a day. She was emotionally tortured, obviously physically as well, and sexually by George. Now, it was because of all the abuse that she endured that Miriam ended up running away from home, never to return again. However, she would say later on down the line that when she left, she always regretted not taking Tracy with her. And as you can imagine, when Miriam left the home, this left the majority of the abuse to be endured by Tracy because Miriam was no longer there. So now Tracy was the one experiencing the emotional, the physical, and the sexual abuse. Now, growing up, Tracy had some very interesting passions and hobbies, to say the least. Tracy had a very big interest in anything witchcraft and occults. She loved anything supernatural. She loved 
learning about Ouija boards. She was very interested in the dark side. She was constantly taking out books from the library to learn more about these topics. And this was in Tracy's early teens that these interests first sparked. Tracy was also described as someone who was very quiet. She wore all black clothes all the time. She kept to herself. She was very timid, very shy. And from an outsider's perspective, people who knew Tracy, they described her as being somewhat of an outcast because of these things. It definitely separated her from the rest of her peers. Now, when Tracy was in 10th grade, George ended up passing away and soon following, so did Avril. Now, when they died, Tracy took this as an opportunity to move back in with Rhonda, her mother, in order to potentially repair their relationship. Tracy initially had a lot of hope for this. She wanted to have a close relationship with her mother. However, it didn't take long to realize that this relationship could not be mended. It was reported that Rhonda did not approve of the content that her daughter was consuming, all of the books that she was reading about the dark subject subject matter. And along with that, it was also said that they didn't get along because Tracy came out as gay during this time and Rhonda did not approve. So because of those two things combined, it really created a tension-filled household. And so because of that, Tracy decided to move out. So when Tracy moves out of the house with Rhonda, she ends up moving in with some of Rhonda's friends. It was a couple named Catherine and Ron. So Tracy moves in with them as well as the daughter that they had. However, shortly after Tracy moved in with Catherine and Ron, Ron began sexually abusing Tracy. Now, as you can imagine, it almost feels like Tracy really just can't catch a break. Now, it was also while Tracy was living with Catherine and Ron that she learned that Ron was also sexually abusing his own daughter. And at this point, Tracy decided that she was going to take a stand. She was going to do something about this. So she went directly to Catherine and told Catherine about the abuse that not only she, but also Catherine's daughter had been enduring at the hands of her husband. Now, when Catherine did this, she immediately kicked Ron out of the house. And at first, Tracy really felt a sense of safety and security in that. It was something that she had never experienced before, having told someone about the abuse that she was enduring and then them acting on it in a way that was benefiting her. It felt like she was being protected for the first time, which is something she had never experienced. However, that was short-lived as well because when Ron got kicked out of the house, that is when Catherine herself began making sexual advances towards Tracy. So Tracy couldn't catch a break at this point. It was one thing after another. Now, if you're wondering why Tracy wouldn't just leave the Catherine and Ron situation in their household at that time, it's because she was only 16, 17 years old. And not only that, she had no money. She didn't have anywhere she could go. That was until Tracy turned 18 years old and she received an inheritance of $75,000, which is equated to about $310,000 in today's economy from Avril and George's estate. And when this happened, it really opened up a whole new world for Tracy and gave her a sense of freedom that she did not have before. She was now able to experience life in a way that she was never able to experience it before, and it gave her the opportunity to move her life in the direction that she wanted it to go. Now, during the next few years, of Tracy claiming this inheritance, she definitely put it to use. She ended up getting her own place and she was also able to explore different romantic relationships during this time. So let's talk about those for a second. When Tracy was 21 years old, she began dating a woman named Sunshine. The two of them hit it off immediately and began traveling the world together using Tracy's inheritance money. They ended up deciding that they wanted a child together. They wanted to start a family family. That's how serious they were. And they decided that Tracy would be the one to carry the baby. And in order to get pregnant, the two of them decided that Tracy would have sex with a man. Now, Tracy did get pregnant as a result of this. However, sadly, she did experience a miscarriage early on in the pregnancy, which really deteriorated the relationship between her and Sunshine. And ultimately, the two of them went their separate ways. After Sunshine, Tracy began dating a 
woman named Debbie. Now, at first, when it came to Debbie, things seemed to be going great. Debbie and Tracy moved in together in a house in Brisbane. And again, everything was great for a while until it wasn't. After about a year and a half of dating, the two of them were not getting along. They were constantly fighting. And instead of ending the relationship all in all, they decided the best thing to do would be to have an open relationship. Now, it's not quite clear if this was an incredibly equal decision because when it came down to it, Tracy was incredibly jealous. She did not like the idea of Debbie seeing other women and going on dates. Debbie would even go as far as bring women back to the apartment that her and Tracy shared and Tracy would have to see things and hear things and it was really deteriorating for her mental health. So ultimately, Tracy decided that she was going to get back out there. She was going to put herself out there. She was going to start meeting people, dating, and do exactly what Debbie was doing. And that is when Tracy met a woman named Lisa Pachinski. Now, both Lisa and Tracy were 24 at the time that they met each other, and the two of them had a shared interest in witchcraft and the occult. Anything related to that, they really, really bonded over. Now, over the course of their relationship, Tracy had lent Lisa some money, and the two of them came to an agreement that instead of actually paying her back in cash, Lisa would repay Debbie by cutting herself and allowing Tracy to drink her blood. Yes, you heard that right. Did you forget to add stamps.com to your holiday wish list this year? It's okay. We all make mistakes and I'm here to help. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money during the holiday rush for 25 years with easy access to USPS and UPS services and premium rates for all your postage needs. The holidays are hard enough, so let's make things easier than ever with Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, all you need is your computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. And now, taking care of of orders on the go is even easier with the stamps.com mobile app if you need a package pickup you can easily schedule it through your stamps.com dashboard and if you sell products online stamps.com seamlessly connects you with every major marketplace and shopping cart and with stamps.com you get huge carrier discounts like up to 84 percent off usps and ups rates to help your bottom line plus stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options for 25 years Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses with access to USPS and UPS services that you need right from your computer anytime, day or night. There's no lines, there's no traffic, and no waiting. Give your business the gift of Stamps.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code KILLER. Tracy would tell Lisa that she was a vampire and she had cravings to drink blood. And because they shared this interest in the occult and everything that's related to the dark side, her and Lisa agreed that this was a fair deal. So that is what they began doing. Now, around this time, Lisa had introduced Tracy to two of her friends. It was another couple named Kim and Tracy. So there's two Tracys. It's kind of confusing. However, this second Tracy, the friend Tracy, isn't very prominent in this case, so it shouldn't be confusing. However, if I do refer to her, I'm going to refer to her as the other Tracy. So that's how we can differentiate it here. Now, when the four of them began hanging out, Tracy Wigginton, our Tracy, she was able to convince Kim and the other Tracy, as well as Lisa, that she had telepathic abilities and was a witch who possessed all these different types of powers. And again, she specifically said that she was a vampire. 
Now, I don't know if Kim and the other Tracy and Lisa were incredibly naive or if our Tracy is just incredibly convincing. However, every one of them believed her wholeheartedly. They believed that she was a vampire. Tracy would go on to tell them that her blood of choice was human blood, but lately she had been surviving off of pig's blood that she would purchase from her local butcher shop. So she's telling them that she's drinking this pig's blood, but she still has this strong desire to get a hold of actual human blood and that this is because she is a vampire. And the three of them are believing everything that she is saying. So... This all brings us to October 20th of 1989. On this specific night, Lisa, Kim, and the two Tracys are all out at a nightclub together called L'Amour's. The four of them are out drinking, having a good time, dancing, when all of a sudden, Tracy turned to Lisa and told her that she needed what she called a real drink. She went on to say that this was the night that she needed to find someone to drink their blood. So because of this, Tracy and Lisa gathered up Kim and the other Tracy, and they decided that that is exactly what they were going to do. They were going to find a victim for Tracy to drink their blood. So because of this, the four of them leave the nightclub, they get into the car, and they begin driving around. Now to this day, Kim, Lisa, and the other Tracy said that they went along with this. They went along with what Tracy was saying because they claimed that they were afraid of her because she seemed so serious. She was saying that she was a vampire and they didn't want to get in the way of her drinking someone's blood. And I know what you are probably thinking. It quite literally sounds wild, which is why some people believe that more than anything, the friends just wanted to see if Tracy would actually follow through with it more than anything else. Now, while the four of them were driving around, this is when they spot 47-year-old Edward Baldock walking out of a bar in Kangaroo Point. Now, apparently, when Edward walked out of the bar, he was by himself stumbling, and it was apparent to them that he was very intoxicated. When Edward walked out of the bar, he walked towards the side of the road to hail a cab. However, instead, Tracy and her friends pulled up and rolled down their window. When talking to Edward, they told him that they could give him a ride home and also promised him sexual favors. So he got in the car. Now, instead of taking Edward home, the four of them brought him to a nearby park called Orley Park. Orly was approximately 10 minutes away from where they originally picked Edward up from. Now, when they arrived to this park, Tracy told Edward that he should follow her down to the pond at the park with Kim and Lisa, leaving the other Tracy in the car. At this point, the other Tracy decided that she wanted no part in whatever was about to happen, so she electively took herself out of this equation. So at this point, Lisa, Kim, Tracy, and Edward get out of the car and walk towards the water embankment at the park. And when they walk up to the water, Tracy takes her shirt off and tells Edward that he should take his clothes off as well. Now at this point, Tracy walks away for a moment to get herself situated for what was about to happen. Now, even though Tracy was the one who wanted to drink Edward's blood, the initial plan was that Lisa was actually going to be the one to stab Edward in the neck using Tracy's knife and then letting Tracy drink his blood. However, when Tracy and Lisa were over having a chat while Edward was removing his clothing, Lisa backed out and said that she could not do it. Even though Lisa was now out, this did not stop Tracy. Tracy was still committed to following through with this, so Lisa hands the knife back to Tracy, and her and Kim walk back to the car, leaving Tracy and Edward all alone. Now, at this point, Edward was sitting right by the edge of the water by himself and called out to Tracy, asking her, what are you doing? Before Tracy walked up to Edward, pulled her knife out and said, 
nothing right before stabbing Edward in the side of his neck. Now, at first, Edward tried to fight back. According to Tracy herself, she said, quote, I walked around behind him. I took my knife out of my back pocket. He asked me what I was doing. I said nothing and stabbed him. He went up to grab my hand. I pushed his hand down, withdrew the knife, and stabbed him in the side of the neck. I stabbed him in the other side of the neck, and I continuously stabbed him. I then grabbed him by the hair on his head and pulled back, stabbing him in the front of the throat, and at that stage, he was still alive. Now, all in all, Tracy ended up stabbing Edward a total of 27 times on his face, neck, his back, before ultimately slitting his throat. After she finished stabbing him, Tracy began drinking Edward's blood directly from his stab wounds. After she had satisfied herself with the blood that she had drank, she walked down to the water and cleaned herself as well as the knife off before returning back to the car, leaving Edward's body in the middle of the park. Now, when getting back to the car, Tracy asked her friends if they too wanted to see what she had done to Edward. Now, during this moment, Tracy's friends claimed that she smelt like blood. Kim and Lisa decided that they would get out of the car to check on the body because they didn't know what to believe. They weren't sure if Tracy actually followed through with this. So the two of them get out of the car, leaving the other Tracy still in the car. Like I said, she wanted no part of this at this point. So she remains in the car. That is when Tracy led Lisa and Kim over to Edward's brutally murdered body. Now, after seeing Edward's body, Lisa and Kim ran back to the car with Tracy following them. Tracy got into the car and the four of them drove away. Now, the next morning at approximately 5 a.m., a jogger was the one who discovered Edward's body in the park. Police were contacted immediately and they arrived onto the crime scene. Edward's body wasn't hidden or anything. Like I mentioned, it was just laying out there mutilated, so it did not take long for him to be found. When police arrived on the scene, they began canvassing and they did notice something very, very important. Police discover that inside of Edward's shoe, which is laying right next to his body, there was an ATM card left inside the shoe. Now, when they pulled out the card, they noticed that the card did not belong to Edward, but in fact belonged to Tracy Wigginton. Now, you would think when police would see this, they would think that this was the smoking gun in this case, but it wasn't like that initially. At first, police really didn't truly believe that the killer would be sloppy enough to leave back such a vital piece of evidence. But still, because police had this ATM card, they were able to obtain Tracy's address and drove over to her house to ask some questions. Now, when speaking to Tracy, Tracy did claim that she was in the park that night, however, denied ever seeing or killing Edward. And at first, Police believed her, and a big part of this, surprisingly enough, was because police did not believe that based off of the brutality of the crime scene, that a woman was capable of doing something like that, especially because her and Edward had no known connection. This was not someone that Tracy knew. So Tracy claims that she doesn't know how her ATM card got into his shoe, but she had nothing to do with it, and the police initially believed her. Now, several days had passed after the murder at this point, and police went back to Tracy again. At this point, they weren't approaching her as a person of interest or a potential suspect. They were just trying to see if Tracy could provide a piece of information that would help them in their investigation. But this time, Tracy changed her story. 
Tracy told police that her and her friends were in the park that night and they did see Edward's body, but instead of calling the police, they panicked and left immediately without notifying authorities. Now, when police hear this new story from Tracy, it definitely begins to raise some more questions because why would you switch up your story so drastically? Police gather the names of the friends that Tracy was with that night and decide to go ahead and speak to them about what really happened. Now, when police bring the other Tracy, Kim, and Lisa in for questioning, they decide to question them individually, and it did not take long for them to come out with the truth of what really happened that night. Now, Lisa Pachinski was actually the first one to come forward and be honest with police about what happened. Lisa told police that Tracy was the one who murdered Edward. All three of the women were telling police the same thing, which was that Tracy was a vampire. And not only that, they claimed that she was the quote unquote wife of the devil. They claimed that Tracy had supernatural powers and that they were all under Tracy's spell when the murder took place. They explained that Tracy expressed her desire to drink human blood, and that was the motivation for the murder. So with all of this new information that police are gathering, they officially go ahead and arrest Tracy Wigginton for the murder of Edward Baldock. Now, as you can imagine, when the media got a hold of this case, it was game over. This case was everywhere. Everyone was so highly invested in this because this was a case that truly sounded so outlandish. It sounded like a movie. Now, before this case ended up going to trial, Tracy had to be evaluated by several psychiatric experts to see if she was even fit to stand trial. So this consisted of her being under a hypnosis for 26 days hours. During the hypnosis, Tracy revealed that she had four personalities inside of her. The first personality is what she claimed to be called Big Tracy. Tracy described Big Tracy as someone who was very anxious. This was a personality who was very nervous, very timid. Big Tracy had a conscience and was horrified by the murder and what she did to Edward. Then the second personality was Little Tracy. This was the Tracy that resented Tracy's former child self. This was the Tracy that was on edge and the one that had angst. Then the third personality is what she called the observer. The observer was the personality who was claimed to have no emotion whatsoever. He was just the observer. They sat back and watched as things happened. Then the last personality out of the four is what Tracy called Bobby. Tracy described Bobby as a badass. She was a motorcycle riding woman who did not care about anyone or anything. And Tracy claimed that Bobby was the one who was responsible for the murder. Now, based on all of this, multiple psychiatrists believe that Tracy had multiple personality disorder. However, you also had some other experts who believed that she was a really great actress. They believed that she was making this entire story up. However, regardless, the judge ultimately decided that Tracy was competent enough for trial. So when this case goes to trial, Debbie which if you remember, Debbie was the girlfriend that her and Tracy had that open relationship with, Debbie testified at trial. Now, it should be noted that Tracy came forward and said that if she had not gone out that night and murdered Edward, she would have drank Debbie's blood instead. So basically, Tracy is saying that she would have killed someone regardless. But Debbie took the stand during this trial and told the jury that the night of the murder, when Tracy Tracy got home that night, Debbie could tell that something was up with Tracy. She claimed that Tracy was not acting like her usual self. She was very on edge. She said that when she got home, she could tell that she had this huge adrenaline rush. Along with that, Debbie claims that Tracy told her, quote, I want you in the bedroom right now. I've just seen a dead body, end quote. Now, without questioning that, Debbie claims that the two of them had sex and then went to sleep. 
Debbie claimed that during the night, Tracy was tossing and turning and kept mumbling to herself over and over saying, quote, this is real. Now, ultimately, Tracy was found guilty of the murder of Edward Baldock and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 13 years. Lisa was also found guilty and was sentenced to life as well. Kim was found guilty of manslaughter and was sentenced to 12 years. And the other Tracy was acquitted of all charges. Now, in 1996, Tracy did an interview from prison where she said that she was, quote, in a blind fury when she stabbed Edward and claimed that while she was taking his life, she was letting go of the anger from the abuse that she endured during her childhood. She said, quote, murder is a terrifying experience. It's extremely scary to have that much power. It's playing God with life and death. Nobody should have that sort of power, but we all do. End quote. Now, while in prison in 2006, Tracy did assault a fellow inmate and a prison guard. However, she was ultimately released from prison on January 11, 2012, after being granted parole after serving 23 years of her sentence. Now, since this, Tracy has really been living under the radar in Southeast Queensland, Australia. However, interest in her rose again in as recently as 2021, when Tracy started posting on her Facebook page. She started posting pictures of vampires and skulls, and one picture she even posted had a text on it that said, quote, now panic because I am back, end quote. Now, because of this, a lot of people believe that Tracy's parole should be revoked. A lot of people think it's unsettling for someone who claimed to be a vampire at one point and who even murdered a man to be alluding to those previous actions again. So I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about that. And with that being said, you guys, that is the case of Tracy Wigginton. And that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and subscribe. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly every Wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye.